Well, good morning, church. Welcome to the last Sunday in April. Does it seem like it's been six Sundays? This is our sixth Sunday apart, staying at home. And um, I don't know if it feels like it's gone by fast or slow. Some days it's slow, some days it's fast. But I hope that you are ready for church today. I am ready to share and the resurrection of Jesus is still so relevant. And that's what we're going to look at. We're looking at dangerous faith. What are you willing to risk for God? That is our premise over the next several weeks. So I hope that you're doing well. I hope you're safe. If you're not part of a life group, please let us know. We are, are shoring up our life groups, making sure they're solid. We're going to start driving some ministry through that as long as the governor gives us the okay and we feel like it's safe and, and everyone's healthy. And so please let us know that. If there are any other needs that you have, we would like to know that as well. And so we can pray for you, try to minister to you. Before we get to our music, would you pray with me? Father God, thank you for loving us and caring for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus, coming and dying on the cross and, and, and coming back to life three days later, conquering sin and death. We can't thank you enough for all that you do for us. Thank you for being our hope. Thank you for being our sustainer and taking care of us. God, I pray that you go before us now as we enter into our music and we open up your word in a little bit. I pray that this puts a smile on your face, how we're trying to do this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, hey everyone. It's great to be here with you again. And we're here to give God glory for the amazing grace and love he has given us. And even when we are dead in our sins, God gave us life through Christ.
Seek me. 
and awesome you are. Despite the chaos around us, you are still good and you are still faithful and you're never, ever going to let us down. I ask that you would strengthen us, that we would choose to trust you and choose to have faith and choose to find the joy in the ordinary and in the mundane and use this time to not just love you fiercely, but to love the others around us fiercely. I praise you for this opportunity to worship, and I ask that our hearts would be open to listen to the message today. We love you so much. In Jesus' name. We are on week two of Dangerous Faith. <clears throat> and once again, I've scoured the internet looking for crazy danger signs or caution signs. And three of them today have been sent in and we're going to use them. All right, so here is my top 10 list for April 26th. All right, number one, the sign, beware of the dog. The cat is not trustworthy either. I'm sure some of you could put that on your house and it would work. Number two, I don't think it's all that funny, but it sure is true. Here's number two. Caution, this machine has no brain. Use your own. Number three, this is for the teenagers. So I'm just giving it to you, teenagers. Here you go. Here's your caution sign. Messy room, enter at your own risk. Note to my children, mom lives here. Probably not a good idea to use that one. Just saying. All right, number four. Number four, some of you probably would love to put this sign up at your workplace. It says, warning, to avoid injury, don't tell me how to do my job. Please don't tell me if you've already put that sign up. It's just funny. All right, number five, before we put it up. Number five, I want to see how many twisted people out there are just like me. I, I mean, other people that I know. I want to see how many twisted people we have out there. Um, I'm not going to read the sign. I'm just going to put it up and, and see. All right, here we go. Let's put up the sign. All right, if you're laughing, then you're one of those twisted church people. Just saying, putting it out there. All right, number six. This is a great question. I can make it to the fence in 2.8 seconds. Can you? Nice question. Number seven of my top 10 list. I get this one. Um, I got this one from my daughter. I don't think it's funny. Let's go ahead and put it up and see if you think it's funny. Caution, men at work. Women work all the time. Men have to put up signs when they work. I find no humor in this. Uh, all right, well, maybe a little bit. It is kind of funny. All right, next one, number eight. Number eight, I believe that all the superior people watching this will applaud. All of the incredibly intelligent people on this planet will applaud this warning sign. Ready? Here we go. Number eight, in case of fire, exit building before tweeting about it. Anybody out there clapping, applauding that one? All right, number nine. Number nine comes in from a friend of ours from Michigan. Her name is Ann. And um, she has an awesome mom, Lois. Lois sends me cards and notes, and she signs it, your forever friend, Lois. And so, hi, my forever friend, Lois. I hope you're doing really well. But anyway, on the way to Lois's place in, in, in the, the top side of Michigan, this sign can be found. I have no clue why it's there in public. So Anne has actually dubbed this sign the cow abduction area for aliens. I have no idea what this sign is about. Let's go ahead and put it up there. Check it out for yourself. That's just crazy. It's crazy. All right, number 10. Number 10 comes in from Justin Miller. This caution sign is actually in one of his tractors. And so I'm gonna try to read it word for word. All right, ready, here we go. This is what it says. Caution. One, open the window from time to time for fresh air circulation while turning on the air conditioner. Two, never sleep in closed cabin during turning on air conditioner, otherwise it may cause operator to death. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, well, let's get to the topic of the day. Dangerous faith. What are you willing to risk for God? 
I want to share my heart. I, I want to give you just a little bit of the peeling back the curtain of why am I talking about this? What, what's my motivation in, in addressing something like this? <clears throat> well, very much so like Jesus' death and burial and resurrection. Everything changed for the disciples. It would never be the same. And, and we see them fearful prior to the death of Jesus and then taking incredible risks after the resurrection of Jesus. And, and today... I believe that with coronavirus and what's going on on the planet, at least in my lifetime, I don't think it's ever going to be the same. Things are going to be different. And so at a time like this, you know, I have a son who lives on the west side of Michigan, and one of his friends called him and said, please, can I come over and have a bonfire? I will keep my distance, but I'm going crazy. At a time like this, us Jesus followers... Not only should we share our hope, but we need to share our hope with people. And so just like the disciples who took some risks and, and they wouldn't shut up about Jesus, very much so, I believe we're in the same situation where we can't keep Jesus to ourselves. We need to share our hope. And people are looking all over the place and their, their, their lives are paused just like the rest of us. But what's getting us through is Jesus. And, and so... That's why I want to talk about this. It's not because hey, I could give you another talk. Yeah, you should be sharing your hope. You should be talking about Jesus. But I, I think it's much, much farther than that. We need to at a time like this. And so we're going to look at some people in the Bible, but we're going to, where does our faith come from? You know, so many people are going to say, oh, I, I know I need to, but I don't know what to say. Well, here's some simple truth. What do we build our faith upon? What do we base our hope in or upon? And there's some very simple things that we build our faith and hope on. And, and here it is. And, and so this is on the screen. We build our faith and base our hope in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Deliverer, our Lord and Supreme One in authority and our God. And what's the proof that Jesus is those things? That he is the Savior, Deliverer, the Lord, the Supreme One in Authority, Almighty God. What's the proof that, that we have for our faith that our hope can be so strong? It's this. This is the proof. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us and for all of our sin to prove his love for us. And Jesus Christ rose from the dead to prove that he has power over sin and death. And so that is what we base our faith on. That, that is what our hope is upon. And it's more than just a wish. Our hope is, it comes with confidence because if Jesus truly can come from heaven and say all of the things that he said, and he said he was going to die and come back to life, if he really did those things, then our hope is more than just a wish. It, it's, a, it's a firm confidence that I believe everything else he said. Well, I, I want to go back to, to that time, and I want to look at somebody today that just blew it. I mean, just totally messed things up. Just a master at wrecking his life. Does that sound familiar? Maybe like the person that you see in the mirror every day? I think we're a lot like this person. This person thought awfully highly of himself. This person bragged an awful lot. And then when it really mattered, the things that he bragged about and said, he couldn't even come through on. And so we are a little bit like this person. So, before I tell you this person's name, as we see him wrecking things and, and, and running in fear and, and just cowering, and then everything changed and he becomes a giant, before I tell you his name, I want to talk to the skeptics just for a minute. But for people that, that are like me, I, um, I sometimes question. My dad was my pastor and I was raised in the church and went to Bible college and and all of that kind of stuff, but that doesn't mean that I have blind faith. I am a skeptic. And many, many years ago, I spent a lot of my time investing in, well, what's right, what's true, and I looked at all kinds of different religions and, and theology, and here's something that truly, truly has helped my faith. And so for the skeptics that are listening, I hope that you take this in, this thought. You see, Prior to Jesus' resurrection, leading up to the death of Jesus, when he was arrested in the garden, 
all of these people, all of his followers, ran away in fear. They, they were afraid that it would cost them their life. And so they took off. They didn't want to suffer, they didn't want to die, so they're gone. So then, something happened. All of a sudden, we see them with dangerous faith, taking incredible risks for God. And what happened? This is why it helps me in my faith, is because... These disciples who ran away in fear before the death of Jesus, at the resurrection of Jesus, they all put their life on the line. They refused to stop talking about Jesus. They would not deny. They actually suffered, and many of them were martyred because they wouldn't stop talking about Jesus and his death and his resurrection. That helps my faith. Because if they, all of a sudden, when it got tough, stopped talking, well, then they really didn't believe it. See, we all know people like that. They can say all kinds of things, but then when the pressure's on and, and when it's all heavy and, and then they walk away, well, to me, I say, well, that's not something worth believing in. But these people, they couldn't unsee what they saw. They couldn't unhear what they heard. And they wouldn't stop talking about Jesus and how he came back to life and how he is the Savior and the Lord and, and the Supreme One in authority. And they, most of them died as to what they were saying. Many of them were, were, suffered. That helps me in my faith because they didn't stop. They were willing to die for what they were saying. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the person of the day. Let's talk about the person of the day. Person of the day, you probably have guessed it, it's Peter. Peter has, man, he did he wreck it? In so many ways, I think we're like Peter. We, we like to brag. We think highly of ourselves, and, and we say things. And then when it gets tough, we kind of bail. <coughs> so, so let's look at John chapter 13. We're going to kind of just do a stone's throw across the pond, and we're going to look at some events in Peter's life. I don't want you to miss how Jesus handled Peter, how Jesus treated Peter. So this is John 13, 31 through 37. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he, the, he will soon give glory to the Son. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. So what's Jesus saying? I mean, he, he's saying this, I'm going to die. Remember, I keep telling you that I've come here to die for the sins of the world. I'm going into the grave. Three days later, I'm coming back. Meet me in Galilee. I keep telling you. And so, so the time is come. It's here. So I'm just letting you know that, that I'm going to die. <clears throat> and then he says this, and, and as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you cannot come where I'm going. So now I am giving you a new commandment Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world <coughs> that you're my disciples. Now you would think <coughs> that Peter would be paying attention because Jesus just said, I'm going to die. And I'm not going to be with you much longer. I'm going to die. Here's something brand new. So don't forget this, guys. Love each other. So, so Jesus does all of this stuff. But what do we see Peter, his, his span of attention, his attention span is, is like the hind end of a flea. And, and so here he is, <laughs> he's bragging all the way through the New Testament, you know. And here's Peter, Jesus just said, I'm going to die, I'm not going to be with you much longer, and here's a new commandment I'm giving you. And, and Peter's like, where are you going? Hey, where are you going? And, and, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm just like that. There are times when I am praying and I get sidetracked and, oh, God, forgive me. And, you know, and then I start praying again. And, oh, there's a train whistle. And, and, and you know, I, my attention span. And I'll read the Bible and I get, and then I'm like, what did I just read? And I go, so, so I'm giving Peter a break on this. But Peter, let's get back to this. Verse 36, Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't it come now? I am ready to die for you. Big, bold words. <clears throat> I'm going to jump ahead. 
through some of the events and pick it up where Jesus is arrested. He's now been taken out of the garden and all of this torture, all of the stuff that's going on. And he is standing before the high priest and all these people are there. And, and Peter has kind of slithered along, kind of hiding in the shadows. And he makes it to the courtyard and he's warming himself by the fire. So here we are. Peter's warm his hands, trying to be inconspicuous, and no one with authority, no threatening person comes up to Peter. It was this teenage girl that comes up and simply asks Peter a question. Here we go. Matthew 26, verse 69. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus the Galilean, but Peter denied it in front of everyone. <clears throat> I don't know what you're talking about, he said. No one with authority, just a teenage girl. She was just, hey, I think you're one. And so now we're going to skip ahead some more. And another teenage girl, no one in authority, just another average teenage girl, no threats, comes to Peter. Later, out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. You know, again, there, there's no authority. It's just a teenage girl, just a, an average girl comes up and says, Hey, you, you, and, and now Peter's, go, he's escalating. He's now giving pledges and oaths and like, I, I'm, I'm telling, I mean, I don't, I, I, I pledge, I promise. And, and I don't know him. He's threatened. There's incredible fear going on. Well, let's keep going. Matthew 26, 73. A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. Peter swore. A curse on me if I am lying. I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. <clears throat> and he went away in weeping bitterly. So there it is. A, a, a man who demanded and bragged that he was ready to die. And now he's running away all alone, weeping Bitterly. Does that sound like dangerous faith to you? Yeah, me either. But here's where Peter is. We know that if we read through the book of Acts, that Peter becomes a giant, a giant in the church and God's kingdom. So what was it? We know that, that there's this catalyst that happened in Peter's life. We know that Peter was crucified upside down because he was not worthy of being crucified the same way his Lord and Savior was. So what is it that we see? How did Peter go from being fearful and alone, crying bitterly, to, man, just taking on hell with a water pistol in this dangerous, incredible faith? I want you to know this. It wasn't anything that Peter did or didn't do. It all, it all hangs on what Jesus did. It's not about Peter. You see, Jesus knew before he even chose Peter to become one of his followers, he knew what Peter was going to do. Jesus is God. He knew that Peter was going to deny. He knew that Peter was going to be fearful. He, he knew all of those things and yet, Jesus was willing to have Peter come and be a follower. And this is what I know. Because we're so much like Peter. And Jesus doesn't change. This is what I know. If Jesus was willing to do this for Peter, he's willing to do it for you. And he's willing to do it for me. I hope you get that. I think somebody needs to hear that. You are not too far gone. You are not so far away. You are not a total loser who has totally wrecked his or her life that is so far beyond the reach of Jesus. That's why Jesus came, is to set you right, is to get you on the right track. And Jesus finds so much value in you. 
how do I know this? How, how do I know that Jesus knew? How, how, th there's something that just jumps at me, how, how Jesus treated Peter. And there was a conversation that just it hangs on me and it gives me great hope. It's found in Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. And, and this is just before Jesus and the disciples are going to the garden. It's after the Last Supper. And, and there's this little piece of a conversation that, that I see how Jesus is looking at Peter. Please don't miss it. We're going to give you several scriptures of how God and his son Jesus, how much value they placed into Peter. So, so let's look at Luke 22. Simon, Simon, that, that's Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. I love this. Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny. He knew that he was going to just trip up and wreck his life. And he knew that he wasn't going to be able to honor what he said. And then Jesus is like, no. Jesus is setting him up for recovery. He's like, now, Peter, when you've repented, when you have turned from this craziness, you come back to me. Man, I want to use you because I'm going to need you to encourage people. You know what breaks my heart? is that church people are so quick to find fault in others. They are so quick to pull back grace. You know what I really believe? And I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I truly believe this. I believe that if Peter were in a lot of our churches today, and he denied Jesus the way he did here, he'd be kicked out of the church. We'd be done. There's too much fault. Just, he's gone too far. You know, I love that Jesus is seeking Peter out. I mean, this is a private little conversation that Jesus and Peter, you can almost picture them walking side by side. Hey, Peter, I know you've been saying all these things. I know you've been saying that you're going to die for me and all that kind of stuff. But listen, Satan's going to get after you and you're going to fall to your temptation. And I'm praying for you. And listen, when you have repented of your sin, I got a job for you. And so listen, I, I know it's going to be okay. This is why I'm here. I'm going to forgive you. I just want to say, um, I had a really good conversation with Lisa Arndt this week. And uh, she is in charge of our Celebrate Recovery at CCW. I am really glad that we have Celebrate Recovery. Because I see it. I see Jesus restoring Peter. He's going to him and saying, listen, you, you, there's great value in your life. And I want you to know this. I am not throwing you away like trash. I don't know why we do that. I don't know why we throw people away like trash. Like we're so much better than others. I'm very grateful we have Celebrate Recovery. I'm grateful that at CCW, and I truly believe this, not just talking, I truly believe that people like us who have wrecked their lives can truly find grace at CCW. That people can, can become part of us and walk in and they don't have to fear the judgment. They don't have to fear that someone's going to stare them down. What they have to fear is probably going to be too many people coming and saying hi to them. I love that CCW truly is a place that you can come as you are. I mean, good grief is Skip can wear shorts when it's 30 degrees or 15 degrees out and then be standing outside shaking hands and all that kind of stuff. Man, that just proves that we are a come as you are church. There's all kinds of ways I can, I can say this, but I want to encourage you, CCW, keep giving grace. There is nobody, no human that I know that, that is trash worthy. There's people who, yep, they wreck things. There are people who need to repent and I know that there are people that need to turn away from their craziness, but let's give them a soft landing. Okay, let's get back to our text. Let's jump ahead in the timeline. So Jesus dies. He's placed into the tomb. Three days later, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Lord, the Supreme One in Authority, our God, comes back to life, conquering sin and death. The grave couldn't hold him. And he conquers all of it, which is awesome. He conquers the sin of the world for all time, which is cool. And so what does Jesus do when he comes out of the tomb? 
I mean, just before that, that he's arrested, you know, all of these guys start taken off. And, and you study this out in the Gospels when Peter actually denied Jesus, the rooster crows, and actually their faces met. Peter gazed into the eyes of Jesus, who just a few hours before swore he would die for. And then Jesus looked at him, said nothing. And we see, Pete, what a moment. We see Peter running off, crying bitterly. That's the last time Jesus and Peter looked at each other. Jesus goes to the cross, goes to the tomb. Three days later, he's back alive. I love this. I love this. I cannot tell you how much I love this. There were some women on their way to the tomb to embalm Jesus. They, I mean, they had no clue that he was alive. So that, that day they're going to embalm his body. And, and God, the Father, made sure that the angels, his messengers, delivered a message. Check out the message. This is Mark 16, 5 through 7. <clears throat> when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now check this out. I love this. Now go and tell his disciples. Well, that's cool, but the verse doesn't end there. Look at this phrase. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, especially Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. You know, I love that this was so specific. This is intentional. This isn't just, oh yeah, by the way. This is make sure you tell Peter. Make sure that he knows how much value he has Make sure you, he knows that I, I love him. Make sure he gets this message. I love this. In 1 Corinthians 15, we're, I know we're jumping around, but in 1 Corinthians 15, we know. We know that Jesus and Peter connected. And, and again, this is what it says. I passed on to you. This is Paul, eyewitness. He's writing this. <clears throat> I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. This is so intentional on Jesus' part to make sure that he gets to Peter, make sure that Peter gets back on, on solid footing to recover, to walk through the repentance and the forgiveness that Jesus offers to all people. And so Peter repents. Man, I blew it. I'm so sorry. And, and, and man, they, they get their, their fellowship back. I don't have time today to get into the whole thing of, of where Jesus is walking through Peter, setting up how he's supposed to function through the church. You know, the the feed my lambs, take care of the little ones, the, the, the children and those young in faith, and take care of those people, care for the flock, care for people, and then feed them, teach them, don't, don't let this slide, disciple them. And, and so Jesus is walking this, John 21, if you want to study that out for yourself. <clears throat> you know, Jesus, I'm very grateful, I'm truly grateful that Jesus is not like us. I mean, we are so quick to find fault in people. I don't Jesus, I don't find Jesus jumping to be so quick to find fault in Peter. And he's not like us. He was not quick to throw Peter away or kick him out of the disciple group. He didn't do that. He didn't diminish Peter's value. What we see is Jesus restoring Peter. But not only was he restoring Peter, he was setting him up for success. He was instilling inside of Peter, yes, you need to repent. Yes, I promise to forgive. And man, I got a great plan for you. Don't you miss it. I want you to be my ambassador. I want you to share my news, my good news with everyone. And so I am setting you up. Yep, you blew it. I knew you would. Remember I told you, when you repent and come back to me to encourage people, I got a mission for you, Peter. I'm not throwing you away. You're too important to me. In fact, 
what you just did is the reason I went to the cross. I got this. My blood has covered whatever you've done. Some of you need to hear that. The blood of Jesus has covered whatever you've done. Yeah, you probably need to repent. You need to stop doing your craziness. You need to turn to God. And you know what? He's got you. He's not going to throw you away. He's not going to remove his grace. He's not going to fold his arms and scold you. He's going to say, yeah, you're getting it. I'm proud of you. That's why I gave Jesus to come and die for you. Come on, come on, come on. Just, just accept my, embrace my forgiveness. I got this. So I want to leave you with this challenge from the man who freaked out before Jesus died. I want to leave you with this challenge with, with this is the proof of, of the resurrection changed everything for Peter. How all of a sudden he became the, this great risk taker, ex, ex, exuding dangerous faith. I mean, he took on everybody and, and he didn't back down at all. Even though he failed miserably, Jesus came back. Jesus forgave. Peter repented. And all of a sudden, man, he got lined up with what God was doing and God used him in a mighty way. And so toward the end of the Bible, we have a statement, a challenge, proof from Peter. And so this is 1 Peter 3, 13 through 15. It says, now, Peter's writing this, now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? Most of the time, you're kind to somebody, you're decent, you're being good to somebody. No one's going to say, oh, I'm going to cut your arm off for being good to me. Nobody talks like that. And so Peter's like, Look, what are you afraid of? You're, just, you're, you're, you're on God's side. You're his ambassador. You're, you're sharing good news. So who's going to be uptight about that? So come on. And then he says this, but even if, even if somebody gets uptight, even if, you suffer for doing what is right. Dangerous faith, taking the risk. God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Again, man, this is dangerous faith coming from Peter. He was afraid of teenagers, these little servant girls. And now he's like, don't be afraid of any of these people. Don't be afraid of even people in authority who can threaten you. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord, Savior, Lord, Supreme One in Authority, God, the Deliverer. You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, you know what Peter's saying? Peter's saying this. Listen, if God can use somebody like me who blew it in so many ways, if God can use somebody like me, he can use somebody just like you. So if somebody asks you about your Christian hope, big word, big word. So many people slide in, well, hey, I gotta have all this doctrine memorized. That is not the instructions of Peter. He is not saying, make sure you get 10 bullet points in your doctrinal statement. He said, if someone asks you about your hope, that means you're living differently. That means people are seeing something different in you. They, they see you having some kind of faith that's beyond theirs. They, they see you taking risks. Because if you say one thing and then when it gets tough, you walk away, just like me, the skeptic is going to say, well, I guess that's not really worthy in believing it. He says, be ready. Be ready. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. How awesome is that? Peter, this dude that was freaked out by, by little girls, the teenage girls, and he was afraid of, I have no idea what he's afraid of. They had no authority. And, and he's like, man, ah, and, and, and he's freaking out. Now, all of a sudden, he's like, listen, if it's a teenage girl with no authority or somebody with great authority, man, you don't shut up, man. You speak up and, and you just let it go. Let it rip, man. And if you suffer, so what? God's going to reward you. And, and so he's paying attention. Be faithful. Have dangerous faith. And are you picking this up in this verse? where Thomas was the first one that, that proclaimed this about Jesus. He proclaimed, when, when Jesus said to Thomas, stop doubting, believe. And Thomas's reaction, it still just weighs on me. He looked at Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. 
the first person who proclaimed that about Jesus. And now, as we read this, and Peter's like, listen, listen, th this is it. I mean, you, you must worship Christ as Lord, the supreme one in authority, the deliverer, the savior, the almighty God. And, and, and we see this. And Peter's like, no, he is my Lord and my God. And I will not stop talking about him. I cannot see what I saw. I cannot hear what I heard. And, and Jesus has changed my life. You see, when someone talks to you, and, and you don't have to have a whole bunch of doctrine, but you can talk about how Jesus has changed your life. Hope. They can sit, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But if they knew you before, and they see you differently now, what happened? It was Jesus. So tell people how Jesus has done this, how Jesus has changed your life. Okay, so back to the Peter thing. You know, Peter is is challenging us to, so what if you suffer? It's no big deal. Be ready. Be ready if it's a teenage girl with no authority. Be ready if it's someone that has authority. Be ready if it's your boss. Be ready if it's your spouse. Be ready if it's your kid. Be ready if it's your teacher. Be ready if it's some, some young person. Somebody that, that's out walking, whatever. Somebody that, that all of a sudden shoots you some kind of a, a social media message. Be ready. You know, what is going on? With this. You see, I want you to know this, or I want you to share this. Peter is not challenging us to share what we know. He is challenging us to share the hope that we have. And I'll say it again. Peter is not challenging us to share what we know. He is challenging us to share the hope that we have. Big, big difference. It's good news. People are desperately seeking hope. They're seeking something to come of all of these things. You see, I think that we all have a little bit of Peter in us. The pre-crucifixion Peter is a little bit in us. And I think we do get scared. I think we do get nervous. And, and you know, maybe, um, I don't know. I, I think we all have the ability to deny Jesus, just like Peter. That's what I'm saying. It, whether it's in something that we say or something we don't say or something we do or that we don't do. I mean, we can kind of distance ourselves from Jesus, our Savior and our Lord and our God. And, 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 and you know, I, I, I want a little peace, but, you know, I, I, that is not what Peter's saying. I think that's a form of denial is when we distance ourselves from Jesus. Man, I am all in. Jesus died for me. It feels incredibly strong and awesome in my life when I'm forgiven or whatever I mess up like Peter I mean, we, we all wreck stuff and then we repent and we go to God and I, I gotta get clean I, will you help me and yeah yeah I value you I, I died for you I, we got this together come on come on come on so don't forget don't forget that Jesus is our Savior our Deliverer don't forget that he is the supreme one in authority. There is no one stronger or bigger or better. And he truly is our God. And the same one, the same one that restored Peter, the same one that set him up on the right path, is the same one that we talk to. And I'm going to say it again. If Jesus restored and forgave Peter, He'll do the same for you. I want to remind you that even after Peter just totally destroyed it, and we probably would be kicking him out of our church because of his denials and his oath and his swearing and all of that stuff, that Jesus sought him out. And he made sure that the angels told the women, make sure you tell Peter I'm back and I'm alive and I'm well. And then we know that Jesus had personal conversations with Peter and set him up. And so, if you're living that Peter life, the pre-crucifixion life, and you're fearful, and you're nervous, then I'm telling you I'm playing goalie again. And I'm going to kick you right back in the direction of Please dig into Jesus' death, 
in his burial, in his resurrection. Because he came to conquer sin. He came to conquer fear. He tells us, I've not given you a spirit of fear. I've given you a spirit of power and love and sound mind. And so that is what Jesus can do for you. So I'm asking that you determine some things today. I, I, I usually, and I like to do this, I like to say imagine with me, but today I'm not. I am asking you to decide, to predetermine some things. And so we're going to put these on the screen. This is what I want you to really think through and decide and, and be steadfast in your determination. All right, here's the first one. <clears throat> Determine today that even if something difficult comes your way, like rejection or ridicule, that you have already decided that you will share your hope in Jesus. Even if they reject you, even if they just, you know, just, just throw all of your words away. So what? You can still share your hope. And you can still talk about how Jesus has changed your life, even if they don't want it. Maybe they're just not ready for it. But you know what? Maybe that seed is what needs to get planted so that a month or two or three from now, when they truly need something, they're going to, oh yeah, I, maybe I should go back and talk to that person. Be different. Share your hope. The second thing I want you to determine and decide today, determine today that because of your faith in the resurrection of Jesus, that you will be bold and courageous and not worried about what people say or think, and you will share your hope in Jesus every time that you can. You know what? There are times in my life that I have prayed, God, give me an opportunity. And you know what he says to me? You create your opportunities. There's people all around you. Why aren't you just speaking up? You know, there are people that we know, and, and you know, there's some people who are just great evangelists. You know, they're in the grocery store, and they bump into somebody's shopping cart with their shopping cart. Next thing you know, they're leading them to Jesus. And, and you know, so you go to the grocery store, and you ram your cart into somebody else, and they start cursing at you. I, I get this. But speak up, and don't be worried about their reception. Jesus didn't tell you to worry about what they say, or what they think, or what they do. What we're instructed and challenged to do is share your hope. Just tell people the good news and, and give them a good message. Okay, the last one. Prepare yourself and be ready today to explain the hope that you have in God, no matter who it is that asks. Be ready. Be prepared to share it. Think through in your head, what am I going to say? What if it's this person? How, how, how would they receive this? You know, know your audience. Know who you're talking to. If you're talking to your five-year-old child, you're going to speak so in a way they understand it. If you're talking to a 50-year-old person, maybe it's your boss, co-worker, whoever, think about your audience so that they receive your message. Be prepared. Don't, don't just wait for it to spring on you. Decide and prepare and share the hope. All right, so I, I feel like uh, it is time to wrap this up, and I just wanna leave it today with our scripture. So I'm gonna read what Peter challenged us with, and then I'm gonna close us out in prayer, and then we'll sing to God. First Peter 3, 13 through 15 says, Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord, as, as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Let's do this, church. I mean, we have incredible hope. We have good news we can share this with people, and we need to share it with people. It's not that we should. We need to. They need it. And so if we, who claim to be Jesus followers, aren't telling people the good news about Jesus, who will? So let's do this. I'm just going to say, I don't know what's going on with Fight Club Pink, and I shouldn't know, but I can tell you that some of the guys in our Fight Club, they're putting it out there in, in their statements. And I can tell you who or what they say, but man, God is calling me out, and i, I got to start talking about Jesus to people. 
And, and so, man, I am proud of you guys. And, and so this is what we need to do is to share our hope, to always be ready. And, and let's go, man. Let, let's get something done for Jesus. Let, let's help God's kingdom go further, faster. Coronavirus doesn't cancel out the resurrection. It just gives us an opportunity to talk about hope. So let's do it. Okay, so let me pray, and I'm going to shut up. Man, I am fired up and ready to go. I I'm asking you to join me. Man, let's flip this world upside down for Jesus. Let's flip our communities and our neighbors and our families, our, our co-workers upside down. Not literally, but let's do it for Jesus. Let let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for that you are a God who knows how to make a difference. And forgive us, Father, for the times that we want to throw people away. People annoy us. We find fault in them. Whatever it is, you tell us to love them. And, and just like us before our Jesus days, man, we were good at wrecking our lives and we were probably annoying people too. And, and so I am asking that we see people the way you see people. The, the Peters out there that are really good at wrecking their lives. And, and man, your son Jesus, did he ever set him up for success? God, help us to be people like that, setting people up for success. God, give us boldness and courage. May we kick in the doors of opportunity and share Jesus with people. It doesn't matter if we know him or we don't know him. Let's share hope. So God, I am praying for everybody that's taking in this talk that you give everybody opportunity for conversations. I pray that you just light us up with your spirit, that your spirit guides us in the way we think, in the way we talk, in the way we prepare our minds. When we go to ball games, man, we paint our faces and some people paint their bellies and man, they're ready to go for this game. God, help us to be ready for this game of life. Help us to share our hope. God, I need to shut up and let you just take over. I am ready to keep talking. But God, may you use us. May, may CCW be an incredible light and, and just an incredible source of hope where we point people to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's do this. Take some risk, dangerous faith.
never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.